I've got a small but kind of growing collection of uh, old vintage textbooks. Not massive ones, not incredibly rare ones yet. Um, but I collect them mostly to see what the old style of science was like and whether there are any techniques in there that we might have lost or might be interesting to pick up. Um, so I thought, well, let's dive into some and see what they're like. Um, so this one is a refresher course in mathematics by uh, Frederick Cam, FJ Cam. So I did a little bit of digging on this guy and he is the founding editor of uh, a number of kind of hobbyist engineering magazines, uh, including uh, Practical Mechanics, uh, Practical Motorist, uh, one of them, the Practical Radio Hobbyist. I can't remember the name, it's actually still going. And he's also the younger brother of the guy who designed the Hawker Hurricane fighter plane. Uh, so obviously a very engineering uh, focused family. And this one comes from 1943, first published still, I think this edition is 1955. So we're talking pre-computer, this is not incredibly old. It's not necessarily gonna be completely different maths. Uh, and it is intended to provide a refresher course for mathematics uh, for people who have previously mastered the subject but have forgotten the fundamental facts. And it really is just a list of the basics. Uh, decimals, uh, how to do division, how what all the signs mean. The subjects do get more advanced. We start with the addition and then we're going to plotting graphs. So we you know this is not evolved a great deal since the mid 20th century. We would now use computers to do this and get the graphs plotted perfectly, but they were always hand drawn back then. You could always find slides on presentations were hand drawn. They had to be etched kind of at scale on the slide. And doing graphs like that would have been part of that. So let's have a look at what we were talking about, averages, ratios. And the one I wanted to look at, here we are the square roots and the cube roots. Uh, so this is an algorithm to work out the square root of a number. So there are multiple ways of doing this. Uh, there's the Babylonian method, uh, Newton's method, the more generalized version, and this, this algorithm. So if you have been taught how to multiply and divide and add up in school, uh, you were probably taught an algorithm more than anything else. Um, that's what the column multiplication actually is. It is, an, it is an algorithm, it is a method that you repeat and you should get the right answer. It's not necessarily a mathematically robust uh, explanation of how the system works, um, but it should get you the right answer. So let's see if we can make sense of this, bearing in mind that this is a refresher course. It is not meant to teach it. Square root, the method of extracting the square root is as follows. Uh, mark off the number, the square root of which is to be found into periods by marking a dot over every second figure, starting at the left decimal point. To draw a vertical line next to the left of the figure in a bracket. You can kind of get the feeling here um, that this is really about the notation. Let's, let's just see if we can replicate the example for a moment. Let's do, what is it, one, one, five, six. Mark them off every two, or bracket. Uh, line down. I'm gonna put the answer here, I think that's what it means. Find the largest square in the left hand period and place this root behind the bracket. So that is okay, so we need to find the largest largest square. Implicitly that is square number. So the largest square number we can see it in the example is, is nine. So we place the root here and and here for some reason. Uh, okay. Um Next square, next the square of this root is subtracted from the position. This is weirdly redundant. The square of the root. So we find the largest square, then you find the root, then you square the root. Okay, so that's three times three, that's nine. Square of this root is subtracted from the first period, and the next period is brought down adjacent to the remainder and used as a dividend. So 11 minus nine, that's okay. 11 minus nine. Well, that didn't help. Right, so 11 minus nine, that's two. And then you bring the next period down, that's five, six of 256. So we've got this remaining. Now multiply the first root found by two and place the product to the left of the vertical line. So re, multiply that by two, place it to the left of the vertical line. Yeah, so now multiply the root found by two and place this product into the left of the vertical line, then divide it into the left-hand figure of this new dividend, ignoring the right-hand figure. What does that mean? 
now divide it into the left hand figures of the new dividends, ignoring the right hand figure. So that's 6 into 25, which is 6, 12, 24, okay, that's 4. Right, so attach the figure obtained, finally subtracting the hook. Multiply the latest divisor by the figure of the root last. Of you just fold it in. 4? So 64 times 4? Multiply finally, it's a the product from the dividend. If you say fold in one more time. It says fold it in! So 64 times 4 was 64. I'm going to try it. 256. Subtract that. Okay, so we terminate at zero, don't we? So what I think this is doing is if you think about what a square number has to be, we have a square x on one side x on the other, and the total area of that is x squared. So this total area is going to be 1056, x is going to be 34. What is happening is we've split this up, I will not draw it to scale, like here. So we have uh, 30 and 4 here, and 30 and 4. So what we've got here is 30 times 30. Or 900. So this 9 here at the top is not really a 9, it is a 9 and a 100. Um, so we're working out that as a perfect square. And the rest of the square are these three areas, which must add up to, in total, 256. So we're trying to back calculate uh, what that number must be. And if we get it exactly right, then the algorithm terminates. If not, we have a little bit of a square left over and we start again on the next period. So we're multiplying it by two because we've got this area here, which is four times 30, and this area here, which is four times 30, and there are two of those. So what we've really got is if we ignore that square for a moment, just ignore that one, we've got two that are gonna be four and 30. So if we times that, three by two, we get six or 60 here. And then we're trying to really back calculate what that number should be. And any remainder is there, I think. So I think that's what that's getting at. That's what that's doing. So let's try, let's try another example that's not in here. Let's do 256. I know that 256 is 16 squared. It's one of the powers of two. So well, the answer to this should be 16. Let's, let's, let's try this one. So we're going to square root 256. Uh, mark off the number of the square root of which is to be found into periods. Two, five, six. So we've got one period there, one period there. Draw a dot over every second figure. Draw the vertical line. Next, find the largest square in the left-hand period. Well, the left-hand period is two, the largest square number, and that is one. The square of this root is subtracted from the first period. Yep, that next period is brought down. So two minus one is is one. We're going the next one down, 156. Now multiply the first root found by two. So we'll do that times two. And divide it into the left-hand figure. So two into 15, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, two, two into 15 is seven and a so that's telling us the square root of 256 is 17. Divide it into the left-hand figures of the new dividend, or, the, or ignoring the right-hand figure, 2 into 15, 2 into 15 is 7, 2 should be 6. Next square of this root is subtracted from the first period, the next period is brought. This is your recipe! You fold in the cheese then! 27 times... What's 27? Oh, what's 7 times 7? 49... 189. 189, so 189. Let's find the largest square in the left-hand period. 2 into 15 is 7. I'm going to have to Wikipedia this. It's a better health calculation. A P to P is a part of the root of how to help. Right. I know what's going on here now. I have checked. There is a slight ambiguity here. Let's start again. 256. And why does 256 cause a bit of a problem? So 256. We want to work out that first root. It is going to be 
a one. The first figure. And we have one, two, and we're gonna do 156. So we've got to divide something into here, and it's either going to be, and we've got to figure out either 26 times six, or 27 times seven. Because if we put the, guess the seven here, or we put two into 15 to get seven, we then multiplied 27 by seven to get 189. That is, 26 times six is 156, which rounds off perfectly. So we would put a six here, and then we do 26 times six, 156, algorithm terminates. Reason for marking these off as periods of groups of, of two is because 10 times 10 is 100. So that's, we are working this out in groups of uh, 100 because if we have anything left over, that becomes another, uh, a, another square that we can deal with. We're doing it desk place by place. And you can kind of see that that's what's going on when we talk about the screw boot because the key boot is effectively the same algorithm, but the periods are placing a dot every third figure. So a cube, 10 times 10 times 10, will be a thousand. There is a, a couple of drawbacks to it. Uh, one, as you can see from this example especially, the numbers you have to start dividing in by get increasingly big. So it, every time you bring another period down, you're adding two figures. But at most, you're eliminating maybe one, and if you get lucky, two from the left-hand side. So this number, every time you have to make a new iteration, grows one larger. And the numbers that you have to then start putting into your head if you want to do this without a calculator are much, much bigger. It would take a... Because you'd have to then divide here by, like, you're doing, what, one... 12,563 dividing into something or multiplying by something. But the advantage of this method is that it is figure by figure. Each figure is correct. Uh, we know from the start of this that this must have begun with a one. That's not going to get better. We know that that number is correct. And if we did it 16, we know that that is correct. Other methods uh, are iterative. So uh, Newton's method, for instance, of finding roots we want to find a root of a polynomial, uh, we kind of guess and we do derivatives to figure it here. And a polynomial like that, x squared minus two equals zero, is the equivalent of solving for the square root of two. But all the numbers in those methods change every time you iterate. This method, the numbers, you just stack on more numbers. They are going to be corrected as an algorithm. This is how it would have originally been done if you want the numbers to be as precise as possible, as quickly as possible. Uh, let's see what else is in here at all. Uh, some shortcuts, so practical men use them. Practical men. <laughs> It's very, very, possibly the most engineering words ever written. Uh, use a vast number of shortcuts in calculations. A few of the more useful ones are given. To multiply by five, add naught to the number to be multiplied and divide by two. Well, very straightforward. It sounds kind of weird, but that is the mental shortcut you would do. Timesing by 10 when you're in a decimal base 10 is it's trivial. Uh, and then halving something is, is also kind of trivial. So it's two operations that are kind of trivial. And you get a lot of resentment towards things like that when uh, people get confused by new math or common core of you in America. And they object to it and they think, oh, why aren't you just doing the normal way that I was taught? But you actually do this in your head and it's more efficient and it's about learning number sense and the, the ability to do these shortcuts. So it's nice to see that this even in the, in the 1940s and 50s and that was actually being taught. I think towards the end we get shapes, geometry, Ah, some mechanics stuff. So mechanics are really useful for science, not because you will necessarily be using these diagrams and forces and understanding them directly, but because 
what these diagrams are is that they have meaningful forces and directions and masses on them and you build equations from the diagrams and that act of interpreting what an equation means versus the diagram and constructing the two out of each other that connection is amazingly useful if you want to do a mathematical science uh, it, this is this is incredibly practical you want to relate two things together and we do see it in physical chemistry you, we have to relate multiple things together uh, if you want to do chemical kinetics you have to link the well you have to link the macroscopic the symbolic and the submicroscopic worlds together it's not too different to how mechanics works you have a symbolic domain and a physical representation of what that means and you have to link them together so that's a really nice thing to see in a book like this uh, and it's nice just to have all of this stuff that is designed to be the refresher of mathematics before you do any kind of science or engineering it's it's interesting how some of it's formatted because obviously this is pre-LaTeX and and pre-Word and etc so how these were assembled I don't know probably having to typewrite at them really difficultly uh, in, with a lot of precision instruments and then copying them or we'll one day work out how that all works so there is a nice book to have I might look at some more later